Coming up on the program today, we're going to talk about some unique ways vegetables are grown, as well as dealing with slugs in the garden. And we're going to talk with Ashley and Juan from Ohm Grown Garden. All that plus your garden questions, and that starts right now. It is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Welcome so much. Thank you for taking time out of your day to join us on the program. I am your host, Joy Baird. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend, and gardening partner. Hi, Baird. The WisconsinVegetableGardener.com is the destination for all things gardening. Over 1,200 garden videos, as well as full segments of this particular program and in, in studio video as well as podcast of it. And it's also on all of your favorite podcast providing websites in their and the full podcast, full replay of the show, as well as segments of the show. Well, there's a number of ways in which you can contact us. Uh, you can do that through a number of methods, one being uh, email at twvgshow at gmail.com. You can also uh, tweet us at hashtag twvg. You can tw- uh, send us a Twitter message. Our Twitter handle is twvgshow, or you can jam your phones in the fi- uh, your fingers in the phone and call us on the IV Organics 3-in-1 Plant Guard Hotline. Ivy Organic 301 Plant Garden naturally protects plants against damaging sunburn, insects, and rodents, protects newly installed plants and trees, shields prune and damage surfaces for use on your roses, fruit and nut trees, ornamental trees, and shrubs. This product is non-toxic, environmentally safe, and organic. For more information, visit ivyorganics.com. You can call in anytime during this show to 414-444-5250. You can always give us a ring-a-ding-ding, and, and we will talk to you right now. So, uh... Yes. Uh, on Tuesday, the 18th, is that Tuesday? Yeah. We're going to be in Germantown. Right. The Germantown Library. Where were you getting to that? No, I, I wouldn't. Oh, no. at 6 p.m. talking about growing great garlic, and that's free program at the library, and learn about how to grow garlic. So with that being said, uh, unique ways some vegetables and fruits grow, Holly. Uh, we have a concept or, or a mindset for many of us. We go to the store, or we see a show on the TV, or or whatever the case is, and we think we understand how certain vegetables and fruits grow, but then when we look into it and, and understand the actual growth cycle or method in which nature has designed them to grow, we become educated and realize we were quite wrong on those type of perceptions that we thought we once had about those vegetables and fruits. So we're going to go over five of them here that maybe you thought you knew how they grew, and, and at, at a point in our gardening career we felt that we knew how certain things grow a uh, grow and grew and then we educated ourselves and found out that it wasn't quite the way we had portrayed them to be so right or even just in general like i don't know it's kind of fun fun facts you know oh well, yeah we're always learning mm-hmm. so number one is the good old-fashioned sweet corn that we're familiar with now number one before we get too in-depth in that uh we want to uh, i want to tell you if you want to get a sweet deal on some sweet corn Go to the farmer's market. I got 24 ears for $8 last week. They were giving it away, basically, because I said, what's the, they, they had a pile of corn on the table and they had a box of corn. It said freezer corn. I said, what's the deal between the two? He said, nothing. We've got more than we can deal with. We want to get rid of it. So I bought. Buy in bulk. Buy in bulk. That, that is right. Um, so corn, corn is grown it's not what we believe as modern corn. That is not the way it was designed no. or the way it had. Many years ago, like 7,000 years ago in Mexico, um, it was a wild grass called uh, teosinite. Yeah. And it looked very similar, uh, not very similar from our corn today. It was just a was, giant big piece of grass. Right. And it did have some kernels. Yes. But not like not like what we have today, right. like the cobs and the kernels. So what happens is over time people start, and the kernels were very tough and hard, and so over time they kind of just modified it so it became more edible. The, the Hispanics, the Mexicans, as well as Native Americans, uh, there's they a, traveled with it. They traveled with it. And then repetitiveness over and over, modifying it, breeding with other species of like uh, plants was able to what over seven thousand years now. Uh, creates what now we are seeing as modern corn, agricultural corn as and sweet corn. Mm-hmm. And the thing about corn, it's one of these unique crops that if humans disappeared off the face of the earth, corn would be extinct in about two years. Right. It, it cannot, doesn't, yeah. it doesn't reseed itself. It will not reseed itself. The corn, if you take a kernel and break the corn apart, like after harvest, and the kernel falls in the ground. Yeah, it will sit there into dormancy and then regrow the next year. But if it just falls from the cob, or fall, the cob falls on the ground, 
it doesn't reseed itself like a tomato or a pepper or no, and especially because it's in that husk. Right, the husk is a is not going to reseed itself. So that's number one. That's that's a unique way. It was a grass, and now it's a stalk over hundreds of years uh, of transforming of human interaction with this particular species of vegetable. Um, next is. The uh, leek. Right. So a lot of people think leeks grow in marshes, like uh, like cattails or other marshy grasses. Now, and people could, you could, you could, you could appear the similarities between a cattail yeah, and a leek. But a cattail is categorized as grass. Right. And leeks are not, correct? Right. That's okay. correct. So leeks are part of the onion family. And I can see why people think that they grow in like marsh. Makes sense. But basically it's like a long, thin onion. With no bulb. With no bulb. So, and, and, or, well, it's like thicker than a chive. It's like kind of like a hybrid between a chive and an onion. And if, uh, and you can use the entire plant. It's not just the white portion at the bottom that many of us are trained to consume. Many countries in the world use the whole plant as edible material. Uh, so that's something that, you know, you don't want to waste your whole leek. It has the same properties all the way through. Uh, next one is strawberries. Right, so strawberries and raspberries also okay. aren't really berries um, in the botanical sense. They are a flower that is trying to reproduce, essentially. So if you look, a lot of things grow out of the middle of a flower, like the tomatoes, crown, the crown mm-hmm. like the tomatoes do. But this is different. Apparently it's just like um, a huge seed from the flower is what a berry is. Well, a typical strawberry can have anywhere from 200 to 500 seeds on the exterior part of the fruit. Right. Yes. So... It's um, it's not quite a flower, not quite a berry. It's a uh, strawberry. <laughs> yeah, and, and you can start strawberries from seed. Yeah. We've done that. Mm-hmm. It's very, very difficult. What majority of the regrowth of strawberry plants in nature as well as in nurseries are they're ever, they're the, the June bearing and then there's ever bearing. The June bearing produces what is called runners, which is an offshoot from the crown or the mother plant, and there's a growth tip that comes out and it can have six, seven, eight points of where it roots into the ground. Once those smaller plants have established themselves by rooting in the, in the ground or an adjacent garden pots, it will detach itself from the mother plant, and essentially you have now four, five, six, seven additional plants that are a, almost, a, a, I guess, a clone of the mother plant, and that's the way a lot of the nurseries, up um, based on, I guess, their contract with their provider of plants, they can uh, produce more plants that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, raspberries, on the other hand, well, the tips will fall over and root in the ground, and then kind of like a walking Egyptian onion to a certain extent and regrow that way. They they just kind of propagate differently. Pro- exactly. Yeah. So, but either way, um, both of them are similar. They're not, they don't grow similar because strawberries are tiny little plants. Mm-hmm. Raspberries get taller. They're more of a bush. But they're similar in the way that they do reproduce themselves. Right. Um, in that way. And then also how they grow. They're not considered technically a berry they are considered a flower that is uh, what we're eating is something that, and I mean, a lot of plants are like this, but it's it's different as opposed to if you're looking at botanical sense, it's not it's not a berry. And, and on, on the raspberries, the blackberries, that thing, a side note, some people will take and, and propagate those after they have a plant that they have bought from the garden center, and then they can establish a, a grove of bushes. The side note to this is some of that, some of these plants, whether you want to believe it or not, whether you think it's right or not, are actually copyrighted by the grower, and it's actually illegal for you to propagate or copy that plant over, just like copying music illegally. It's it's against the law in some instances based on the grower and the specific breeds in which that grower has created uh for you and you bought it and then, you know, however you want to uh, deal with that, I'm just putting that out there. There is legalities in some of these plants that are, the, these plants are copyrighted to where you can't legally reproduce it. It's a one and done deal. You have to buy more just like uh, genetically modified seeds. So we won't get into that. That's another conversation for another day, but it's out there, even for the backyard gardener. Right. Okay. So now we're going to move on to pineapple. Br- oh, let's go to Brussels sprouts first. Okay. Brussels sprouts. Okay. Um, they're part of the brassica family. If you're not familiar with the brassica family, that is also the cruciferous vegetables, cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, kohlrabi, kohlrabi kale, uh, some of those like Chinese cabbage, 
bok choy, mm-hmm. things like that. Okay. So, High yeah. in what, vitamin K? Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and fiber, all that. Good, okay. You know, good for you stuff. Um, so Brussels sprouts are basically, they're like tiny little cabbages. Yeah, it's, it's a plant that grows vertical with a very large stalk, let's say the size of a broom handle if the plant's but growing. I mean themselves. The, yeah, the actual edible portion. Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure if you can eat the stalk like you would a broccoli slaw stalk. Uh, uh, but anyway, know, weird, I, uh, up the stalk. But, so yeah, so they grow on a stalk. Between marble and tennis, or, uh, marble and, and golf, golf ball, ball size. Yeah. So what the stalk then has little branches and these Brussels sprouts grow kind of in the crook of those branches and it's really weird. I mean, maybe not weird, but it's kind of weird. Um, Unusual compared to other things yeah, we're used to seeing. Like, <laughs> if you've never seen them, I would definitely look that up because it's like, it's just kind of different. It's cool. Um, so they start off as these little like tiny, Marble pea type things, and then they grow into uh, Brussels sprouts. And they can sustain a lot of cold temperatures. And we've got a video coming out on the website uh, tomorrow and, the, and all the social media platforms where we top the Brussels sprout off in order to encourage the sprout development rather than vertical continual growth on the plant. So we want to, you know, you want to do that. If you haven't topped your Brussels sprouts, now's the time to do it. Take and cut that growth tip out to stop the top growth and put the stress in and develop the sprouts. Uh, on the plant. Okay, so let's go to pineapple. It's not something we can grow here in Wisconsin. There are people that are successful growing this in a greenhouse. It takes 24 months, though. Okay, so yeah, pineapples are a commitment of time. That's for sure. Um, it's not sustainable. Let's let's put it that way. No, it's not. And so they grow in a bush, uh-huh. and they get propagated from the crown. Uh-huh. So the top of the pineapple is planted. It grows in a bush. It looks like... Um, the spiky plant, mm-hmm. like with waxy leaves. And if you look at, like, pineapples growing, it looks weird. It looks cartoon-like. Uh-huh. It's like this, it looks like a mini pineapple, but then the spikes, like, around the edge of the spikes is red. And it looks kind of unreal almost, the, like the, a, a bright red right. orange. Uh, typical pineapple is yellow in, inside. That's a pure, mm-hmm. uh, there are genetically modified pineapples. And, and there are some uh, new species that are coming out that are alternative colors inside of it. So just be aware of that. Uh, I haven't done too much research into understanding all of that, but I have seen some posts, and I have not confirmed or been denied that they are true or untrue, but uh, there are some genetically modified crops out there that are pineapple, and they take 24 months to grow. And here's the thing that, that it boggles my mind, and, and maybe uh, if, if you can... If you're listening, you can understand it better than I can. I grew up on a farm, so I understand the the small window of opportunity and profit in which a farmer has. So you take a pineapple, you plant it in Hawaii, Mexico, wherever the tropical areas are in the world. Uh, it grows for 24 months. You harvest it or you you have your harvesters harvest it. You ship it 3,000 miles to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and you and I can buy it for a buck 49 on sale. How is anybody making any money on that at all? That pineapple should be about a $27 pineapple. They're not. Exactly. Right. And, and they... it's actually um, Hawaii, Costa Rica, and the Philippines. Okay. Well, mainly that grow these pineapples. And uh, Hawaii is not necessarily a poor area, but right. there are areas that are. And then they tell me, oh, mass production makes money. If you can't make money on small, what makes you think that you're going to make money on 10000 if you're not making money on twenty? And the math doesn't add up. But anyway, that's that's beside the point. It's just fascinating that you can buy something that cheap that takes that long to grow that's shipped that far away to here. So, But that's five unique vegetables in which and, and fruits that you maybe was unaware of the characteristics in which they actually grow in the garden and in nature. Well, when we come back, we're going to deal with a problem that we're facing in the garden now, which is the good old Un, uh, uh, the, the slug. It's not happy. It doesn't help us any. There's a lot of problems. We're going to go over some organic ways and some chemical ways in which we can remove the slugs from our garden right after this. Use Twitter to reach Joey and Holly at TWVG Show or hashtag TWVG. Garden seeds do not have to cost a fortune. Just 99 cents at migardener.com. Now with over 450 varieties of non-GMO, heirloom, and organic flower, vegetable, and herb seeds available year-round. Pay less and get more seeds. Shipping as low as $2.50. That just makes sense. 
Go to migardener.com for seeds and garden needs, tools, and special blend fertilizers. migardener.com. It's that simple. Family owned and operated. Hoss Tools wants to help you grow your own food. From seed starting supplies, hand tools, drip irrigation, harvesting equipment, and a complete line of all-natural pest control solutions, they've got you covered. Keep your garden weed-free with their time-tested, American-made wheel hose that are built to last a lifetime. And the Precision Garden Seeders have proven design for planting a wide variety of seeds. Hoss Tools has what you need to get the most out of your growing space, large or small. Free shipping and outstanding customer service. Shop online or request a free catalog at HossTools.com. Rebel Green, responsibly made natural products that are good for you and the environment. Made in the USA, plant-based, vegan, and always toxic-free. Find out more at rebelgreen.com. Use coupon code WIVEG15 to save 15% off your next purchase at rebelgreen.com forward slash shop. Root Assassin, a garden tool that does all the root functions with its advanced shovel that has serrated edges on both sides. Find out more information at RootAssassinShovel.com. The Power of Garlic. This garden fun fact is sponsored by ManureTea.com. Get your three-pack today. Throw the tea bag in water, let steep, then feed your soil, not your plants. 100% organic. Find out more at ManureTea.com. Always free shipping. Raw, freshly minced garlic has the most health benefits cannot stand the smell of garlic and must cook it, you'll need four and a half cloves to get the same effect. If garlic has sprouted, it's still usable, although it's lost some of its flavor and health benefits. Can't get the smell of garlic off your hands? Run them under cold water, rubbing your hands against a stainless steel object. Purple Cow Organics quickly and naturally increases the uptake of nutrients and water to your plants with their new bioactive vegetable supercharger designed to meet the unique needs by helping the living organisms in the soil help plants uptake the nutrients more quickly through their roots and leaves. Find out more at purplecoworganics.com. Blue Mel's Garden and Landscape Center offers an awesome selection of high quality garden and landscape products. We have just the plants you're looking for. Annuals, perennials, veggies, herbs, and more. Plus, you can always count on us to answer all of your questions and offer expert advice. Blue Mills also carries the largest selection of bulk landscape materials in the area. Enjoy a beverage from our coffee shop while your kids run around in our huge playground. Join our growing list of highly satisfied customers. Visit the garden center that offers everything you're looking for. Visit Blue Mills today. Blue Mills, 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Haas Tools, Tree Diaper, Root Maker, Seeding Square, Rebel Green, Dripping Springs Oya, Zaz Products, Shield and Seal, Pomona Universal Pectin. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show with your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Yeah, well, there's problems that we deal with all the time in, in the garden, and, and we go over this each week. We seem like we uh, tackle another issue, and we're going to talk about slugs. Uh, here in the Milwaukee area and many parts of the country, we've had a tremendous amount of rain, and that encourages the good old not friendly and enemy to the garden, the garden slug, to... Uh, come from wherever they live at and start devouring and damaging our garden. Now, first of all, what does a slug do, Holly, and why is it so devastating to our plants that we have growing? Well, slugs are beneficial to the ecosystem that they live in. It's just because that, they feed the plant, the animals that eat them? Yeah, actually, that's why. Okay. They feed the birds and mammals and whatnot that eat the slugs. They're on the food chain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They, yeah, they're part of the food chain. Um, but they also do decompose uh, things, like, like worms do a little bit. So that's beneficial. But when they are too many, that becomes a problem because they eat your plants. Mm -hmm. And we definitely don't want that. Um, so if, if you have a healthy balance of slugs, that's okay, like maybe a few or whatever, and they're not overtaking your garden, that's okay. But then, like, when they start overtaking... And, and we saw it last week when we were harvesting potatoes, which was a horrible experience because we had problems with potatoes, but we saw a lot of slugs... Just digging the potatoes up. Mm -hmm. They're just in, in the soil. Yeah. Floating around. <laughs> Literally. So, yeah. So yeah. so um, so you can get rid of them. You can do a chemical application or you can do an organic application. Now, true enough, chemicals are not what we encourage in the garden, but they are sometimes that I will say based on a person's uh, problem and uh, extension, uh, the largeness of the problem, I guess, the, the, se the severity of the problem, you might need to use that ca chemical application in order to get things back into check 
So then you can transfer over to using a organic means of uh, control. Right. So, um, so yeah. So slugs are obviously problematic. You can use pesticides, um, harmful pesticides, things like that. If that's your choice, that's fine. There's a number of them on the market. Go to any garden center big box store, they'll have something for you. Mm -hmm. Um, Dealing with them organically, there's a a lot of different things you can do. And and we have done several of these. We had floods very bad in the garden, the front yard garden a couple of years, last year I think it was, two years ago, maybe both, uh, last year. And we did do the first one that we're going to talk about. Right, so uh, beer and cups. And that doesn't mean you just take your cup of beer and put it outside. You have to bury it at ground level. And what happens, you, you want the hoppiest beer that you can get. If you have old beer, that's even better. If you are uh, if you like alcohol, get your neighbor's beer and use it. No, but it's true. Uh, so uh, yeah. something like um, an Oktoberfest beer wouldn't work, but an IPA would work because uh, it's hoppier. A higher IPA? Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. So what is occurring here that is so effective in luring these slugs into the beer uh, when you're putting in the cup and, and burying the cup ground level? Well, they must like it. I don't know. They like the taste of it. The smell? The smell, yeah. So what they'll do is then they'll go to the smell, and they fall in, and they drown. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you have a slug trap. You have some drunk slugs. Now, what happens is the the, the, the problem that some people do, they, they, they go ahead and prote- uh, utilize this method of slug removal, but they put the cup where the problem persists, like right next to the tomato plant or the pepper plant. Where no, the so problem. you want to put them like in a corner away from that. So everything, the smell will lure them away from the plants that they're affecting, and then they'll fall into the beer, and you will get, now the, you'll get hundreds of slugs. Now the problem when you have with this is, when it rains, it dilutes the beer, and you have to reapply or put new beer into that cup. But it does work. But, again, we want to put it away from the issue to lure the, the slugs away. Another so, way is? Um, is to you can use organic pesticides. Mm-hmm. They do sell those on the market. There's um, a lot of great companies that, mm-hmm. uh, that provide that type of uh, product. Now, the next three are stuff you could sprinkle in, around your garden that they don't like, they don't like crawling on. Because the abrasiveness. Have, yeah, it's abrasive. They have the smooth... Bellies that they slug around on, and they don't like they don't like the abrasiveness. Not a hundred percent, but can be effective if done relatively according to the book or recommendations online uh, because of the abrasiveness. So it's not always a hundred percent, but it will detour enough. I think that it will work. So what are some of these in which we can uh, do? Uh, coffee grounds. Okay. Uh, crushed up eggshells. And sand. So cr- coffee grounds and crushed up, crush up eggshells, great for your soil, great for your garden. Sand is not necessarily great for your garden. It's not terrible. Just you don't want to use a lot of it. Right. Not an abundance of sand. Like don't go dumping, you know, playground sand all over your garden. The other thing is what you can also do is pull the debris away from the base of the plants in which they are problematic because that abr- that that debris, the leaves, the pine needles, the, the grass clippings, they kind of use that as camouflage, and when you expose the soil and, and two or three inches around the base of the plant, they feel unsecure, and it kind of acts as a, a natural repellent because they don't want to crawl across the soil to get to the plant because they're exposed to the environment. They don't blend in with the surrounding as nearly as well as if they're in leaves or pine needles or dry grass clippings, that type of thing. And then you've got the... Uh, 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 you people will use uh, copper wire or copper strips that supposedly will gently shock the slug and repel it. Some people say they have phenomenal success with it. Other people say they don't. There are some uh, methods out there. I believe that they're like you hook up to a battery and it will a- emit a small electro- electrical shock to the slugs and repel them. I don't know. We've never experienced to that level. That so they put it around the top of the raised bed. So when okay, the slugs, so yeah. we just had a comment come in. Okay. Um, saying that they like the malty part of the beer, too. Okay. So that's part of the whole fermentation process. Right. Right. So anyway, um, the copper wire, were you saying that? Yeah, the copper wire. Okay. Yeah, I got um, that. They also sell slug tape, which is made of copper. Okay. So and it's supposed to repel them because of the, the, the shock. Yeah, or the, they get the, shocked yeah, by it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then there's good old diatomaceous earth that's used for a number of problems. And regarding insects, I don't know how effective it is. Supposedly it is effective. 
you would just sprinkle that around the plants. Right. And, and, and you know, there are also it's edible, there's edible versions of that as well for human consumption. But the chemical application, let's talk about that for a moment. I just we, want to talk about one thing. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. So salt. Okay. Um, if you, it's kind of harmful to them because it's like their kryptonite. Mm-hmm. So if they get, if you put salt around, your plants, it basically causes them to like melt or something. Dehydrate. Yeah, dehydrate. It, it pulls the moisture from the slug. Yeah. And, and yeah, you want be more of a fine granular salt so they can slide over it enough to where it uh, uh, gets them and they can ingest it and that type of thing. Right. So, yeah. So those are some organic means. Chemical applications, there are, as we talked about, many, many different type of chemical applications. Now, if you're going to go the chemical application route, you want to follow the recommended rates on the back of the package because just because a little means good doesn't mean a lot is better. You want to also realize that most of the chemical applications are non-selective. That means that when you apply the that particular chemical to your your garden, whether it's for slugs or fill-in-the-blank problem, it's going to affect the good bugs as well. And I think that's important because people don't realize that they're trying to get rid of one issue, but it's also, it could cause other issues and snowball. And if the slugs are ingesting this chemical, it problematically could be the next animal in line that eats the slug can ingest the slug that contains the chemical in which killed it, and now that pl- that animal is now infected to some degree or it can kill that animal as well. Now we're getting down to the very root of organic and and being friendly with the earth and environmentally conscious and all that. But it can affect it's a, it's a domino effect. When one ha- one thing happens and we see this with a giant with, with a on a global scale when one domino falls it affects things down well, the line. Well, just right now, okay, so we had no rain basically in July mm-hmm. and most of August and then Mid to end of August, we got a lot of rain. And you know what happened is we got floods. Right. And you think the rain would be good with being that dry, but what happens is the earth can't absorb it as much as we were getting. And so that's how we get the flooding. And then on top of that, now we're being bombarded with mosquitoes mm-hmm. because we got all that flooding. Because the water's laying there because the soil's not yeah. absorbing it up as right. quick as it needs to. So that's just like this. You know, you have to think kind of outside of your backyard, so to speak. So with that being said, if you got slugs, there are some simple solutions that you can resolve them with. Well, when we come back, we're going to talk with a couple, Juan and Ashley. Uh, he's from Columbia, South America. She's from Virginia. They live in Austin, Texas. They're, they started a, essentially a small farm in their apartment, and now they've actually purchased six acres of land to be sustainable. And we'll talk to them about their story right after this. Got a question? Email the show at twbdshow at gmail.com. Pomona's Universal Pectin is high-quality pectin that gels reliably with low amounts of any sweetener. If you're trying to reduce the amount of sugar in your diet, you'll love Pomona's Universal Pectin. Now you can make healthy homemade jams and jellies sweetened to your taste. You can use sugar, honey, or any alternative sweetener you'd like. Pomona's Universal Pectin keeps indefinitely when stored in an airtight container. Easy to use, versatile, and comes with directions and recipes in every box. Find out more and where to buy at PomonaPectin.com. Available at most natural food stores and online. The number one key to healthy, productive plants are the roots. Starting from seed to full-grown plants, RootMaker.com has the answer. From seed starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots, creating a fabulous root system, never again will you have root-bound plants, to multiple-gallon grow bag sizes to raise beds. RootMaker.com has your grow needs covered. Visit RootMaker.com. An Oya is an unglazed porous clay pot with a short neck and a wider belly. Bury your Oya neck deep in your raised bed, container, or ground garden and let the Oya do your watering by releasing water as needed. How? By soil moisture tension for all you techies out there. This is an eco-friendly, efficient, ancient way to water your plants using up to 70% less water than other irrigation methods. It saves you time and is easy to install. Find a retailer through DrippingSpringsOyas.com. Smart watering, easy gardening. 
Do you have a problem with deer or small herbivores eating your vegetation? There is a natural solution that is safe for your pets and family. BobX is the answer. An environmentally friendly solution to protect your plants will not wash off and is guaranteed. BobX deer was independently tested against nine known competitors and rated 93% effective, second only to a physical barrier. BobX can be used on all types of ornamentals, trees, and shrubs. Ask for it by name at your local independent garden center. Find out more? Visit BobX.com. B O B B. BEX.COM. Flame Engineering, home of the Weed Dragon, the perfect propane torch kit for home and garden use. For killing weeds, no need to pull or spray. 100 other uses. Find out more at flameengineering.com. The Gardener's Hollow Leg, the debris and harvesting bag you wear, comes with its own belt attachment, perfect for doing light pruning, weeding, harvesting on the ground or on a ladder, and many other uses. Find out more at thegardenershollowleg.com. Save 10% by using the word veggies at checkout. Zaz Products, offering great quality supplements that can help personal health and increase longevity. Committed to bringing you the highest quality products at the lowest price. Find out more at ZazProducts.com. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener is brought to you by the following. Handy Safety Knife, BioSafe, Tall Earth, Chapin International, The Plant Booster, Ivy Organics, Woodman's Market, Blue Mel's Landscaping Garden Center. Purple Cow Organics. Find all sponsors at the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com and thank them for their support. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show with your hosts, Joey and Kelly Baird. Well, fall fall is here. We're getting close to being fall. And what does that mean for Blue Mills? They've got their fall merchandise coming in on a daily basis. They've got the fall mums. They're going to have pumpkins. They've got uh, everything you need. If you like fall, that's the place to go to get your pumpkins, do your carving and your fall decorations and whatever else you celebrate in that time of year. Whether you like fall or not, it's here, and Blue Mel's is there to get things that, or, or provide you right. with items that you need. They have all, all you need for all your fall decor needs. De- decor, that's the name. That's all what the I'm, good yeah. stuff. Pretty, pretty moms. They also got the coffee shop they there. They got the coffee shop. A- and check in with coffee. the coffee shop because they have musicians that come and play that you can go and listen to. So that's something that, that they've been doing. So keep that in mind uh, when you're looking at activities in which you want to get out in the community. Blue Mel's uh, coffee shop there at 4930 West Loomis Road. In Greenfield. In Greenfield. Just, just south of Layton. Uh, at 40, 414 yeah, here you go. 282 or go to bluemills.com. Blue Mills, yeah. Again, they've got everything that you need and a knowledgeable staff that are not people that you are new every time you go there. They've been there for years and they know their stuff. Well, Holly, let's go to the Ivy Organics 3 in 1 Plant Guard Hotline and bring in our next guest. Yeah, Juan and Ashley are a young couple currently residing in Austin, Texas, and they just bought a farm or land for a farm. They share their growing lives on social media to help inspire others. I have stalked their Instagram a little bit, and I find them very inspirational. Thank you for coming on the program, Juan and Ashley. Hi, good morning. Thank you so much for having us. Well, thank you so much uh, for taking time out of your day to join Holly and myself and our listeners to tell more about your journey and your story. Um, so, Ashley, I'm going to start with you. Uh, you. You're both now, you're both not from Texas originally. How did you guys meet and how did you express uh, begin to experiment with the gardening for both of you? So we met pretty spontaneously, actually. Um, I went, I tagged along a business trip with my sister to Texas, and Juan just happened to be in Texas. And we met through um, some mutual people that my sister knew. And I was trying to study abroad at the time because I was still in college, and everyone recommended me to talk to Juan because he was studying in Argentina. So. Uh, we met there, kept talking ever since. I eventually moved to Argentina with him, and we found out we both were really passionate about nature. We're very outdoorsy people. We're always going camping and found ourselves traveling to places outside of the city just to be in nature in general, and we both kind of knew we loved that lifestyle. So we started talking about um, what dreams we had, and at one point we really wanted to join some kind of um, like conscious community or something like that, that just was a sustainable community. And then we eventually moved to Texas and decided to buy some land. 
Well, I'll, I'll ask Juan this. Juan, was you, did you have a whole lot of background in agriculture or gardening, or was this something when you two got together and started talking, you're like, yeah, I, I think we should try to do this. This seems like a fun, fun endeavor. Hi, how are you? Hi to all the listeners. So, first of all, I don't, uh, at the beginning, I really, I was uh, studying economy. So, it was uh, something different what I was studying, but I have some passion from growing from seeds and then to see how you create life with plants. So that was something that was really inspiring me. And that's how we start, like, focusing on plan, planning to have a farm in the future, but it was just a dream. Okay. Now, you guys bought six acres of land um, to move to a large, larger scale of agriculture. W- aside from, you know, wanting to grow more, why did you decide to go from kind of the apartment gardening to that massive amount? Why didn't you just, like, maybe buy a house with a backyard or look into, like, a community garden or something like that? Sure. So the whole thing is kind of like um, a revolution for us in that we wanted to escape the typical mundane lifestyle because we have never been a favor of, uh, yeah, a normal lifestyle. And we wanted to become independent of a lot of things and be able to produce for ourselves and wake up in the morning and just work on the land and be in the sun and be outside and be in nature and keep learning from nature. And we have a deep faith and respect for the wholeness and balance of nature, and we wanted to learn more about it. Um, so it was really about the lifestyle that we wanted. Now, now, Juan, you're, you and Ashley are still relatively new gardeners. What is the best advice in which you can give somebody who are new gardeners? Maybe not to the point of your experience of going out and buying six acres of land, but what do you, what, what can you advise new gardeners to uh, when they're when they're growing plants and understand trying to understand plants and how they grow. So, the my best advice is to tell everyone to just try. Don't be scared of killing a plant or something like that. Just try, give a chance, and just see the plant or just focus on that because the plant is going to tell you. If you're doing something good or something bad, so just try and see what what the plants are going to to tell you. But there's not a big world behind the plants. It's a world that we just have to understand. I'm gonna chime in here real quick yeah, because yeah, I would ahead. love to recommend um, a book that really inspired us called The One Straw Revolution by Masanobu Fukuoka. Mm-hmm. And it's about, it's kind of a manifesto about this gorilla gardener who farms sustainably and he talks about the limits of human knowledge. Um, and that nature is designed to do what it's supposed to do. So we tend to rake leaves in the fall, um, when really trees drop leaves to keep themselves warm and things like that. So it kind of talks about a do-nothing technique made up of sustainable practices that kind of eliminate the need for pesticides, fertilizer, tillage, um, any wasteful effort. And it, so we're kind of basing our ideas and our dreams on the same methods and also hoping to um, mimic nature as much as possible. Right, and, you know, I, uh, we follow Central Texas Gardener. It's a PBS program out of the Austin City area, and you guys were featured on there. We're, we're friends with the producer, and, and that's how we found you. But on in that interview, you said something, Ashley, that you allow the plants to do what they need to do, and then you adjust your life around them, assuming, you know, like if they need more sunlight, you deal with that, and, and you uh, – can you explain that, that theory there? Hmm. Sure. Um, so that also has to do with a lot with the fact that Juan and I are very low maintenance, so we don't really mind adjusting our lives around what the plants need. And even today, we are living in um, a city about 
20 minutes away, 25 minutes away from our land for now while we build a house and do that whole thing because we bought raw land. So there's no water, no electricity, and we're working on all those things. But for now, we um, grow some plants where we're living and then transplant them when they're ready or bring them back and forth. If we see that a plant is not doing well on the farm, we bring it all the way back to the city. And um, we're just observing the plants and noticing what they like, giving them more of that, and noticing what they don't like and trying to give them less of that and getting to know them. And if even if we don't know the specific scientific names or all about a certain plant, um, everyone can get to know whatever they're trying to cultivate by just observing and taking that time to getting to know the plant itself without really even needing to know um, necessarily the specific species and, and all that stuff. I, uh, I definitely would have to agree there, especially in your in where, wherever you're growing in your area, too. So you guys like to grow sustainably um, on, you, on your apartment balcony. You kind of do some different things with water, um, kind of being mindful of your resources. How will you keep going with that on the farm in a larger sense? So uh, we start, like, in the apartment was kind of different now that we moved to the six acre land, it was a big challenge because you have to create almost a new entire environment over there. And you have to know that here in Texas, it's really, really hot. So first of all, we are focused in to create soil, and with that, create microorganisms. And those microorganisms, we have to know that they are the ones that is, are going to give nutrients to our plants. They transform the nutrients to our plants. So the most important thing of of that is to uh, look for a balance and also to know that everything that you your environment and your soil or your land needs is in is in, in the environment. For example, we we have to start like composting also to uh, we start like a little a uh, worm farm so those worms are going to help to decompose some food and also that are going to uh, the worm crafting is going to be in our land that are, is going to give us more nutrients and so the secret is to find a balance and the balance starts with creating a new and uh, healthy soil. Now, I, I have no doubt that, that you will be able to accomplish the goal of using the farm, the farm as a source of income because when people decide they're going to do something uh, and, and nothing can stop them, what are some certain crops that you're at, at this point intending to grow in order to allow that income to come in that you were going to sell or, or go to farmer's markets or whatever the uh, avenue would be? What are some crops that you're wanting to grow that will sustain the lifestyle that you're wanting to have here? So, first of all, uh, we we focus our farm in, in two different uh, business, like long-term and short-term. We have to know that long-term, uh, our big focus and the thing that is going to make us different is that we are trying to install here some and grow some fruit trees. Also, that uh, is going to take us more than two years, three years to be like growing fr- uh, fruits from those trees. So that's long term and short term we are creating a plan to start like growing vegetables. And also, uh, like, like you said, we are trying to get into the North Austin area, a uh, farming market. So that, that's our main focus. And, and you know, you guys are not, you know, do, you're doing this all on your own. You're not having, you know, contractors come out and plowing the land and building the house. You guys are doing this on your own. And, Ashley, how can our listeners uh, follow your journey. Where's the best place to go in order to see the actual day-to-day accomplishments or, or activities that's going on there? 
Oh, sure. Yeah, we're documenting documenting it all on uh, Instagram at Ohm Grown Garden. That's O M G R O W N G Garden G A R D E N. And uh, we'll be documenting the process from there. And we've welcomed lots of fans from Central Texas Gardener also and um, feeling all the love and support. And we did really had no idea this was so inspiring to everyone, but um, I love that it resonates with people and, and I hope that we can keep sharing with the gardening community all over the country. And I don't know how far it will grow, but um, we're going to still keep growing over here on our end. Absolutely. One final question for you, Ashley and Juan. At, at any point in this journey, did you look at each other and go, did we get in over our head? Is this is this a crazy ideal, or, or was there never a doubt? Was it always, this is the goal, and it doesn't matter what it takes, we are going to accomplish what we want to do? So it's funny because it's absolutely both. Um, <laughs> we have a deep desire to do what we're doing, but every time um, we arrive at a new project as a part of the the, the larger forest, I would say, um, like in still, or drilling a well. Um, now we're working on installing electricity and putting the meter pull up ourselves and all these things. We, every time we arrive at a, a new stepping stone where we have to learn a completely new process that we're unfamiliar with, we're like, what are we doing? Mm-hmm. We really have no idea. Or like now we're building a shed on our own. And these are things we're, we're unfamiliar with completely. So we're always questioning ourselves, but there's still that unshakable desire to do what we're doing and know that if we just follow steps, because we're not really reinventing a wheel or anything. We're doing a lot of research. A lot of people have done the different components of what we want to do. Um, so we look information up all the time and are always studying and learning, um, but it's both. Well, Juan, Ashley, we greatly appreciate you taking time out of your day to join Holly, myself, our listeners, and tell your story and inspire all of us to, to go for the dream that we have, no matter how much resistance or how, how much it, it may seem that we are being crazy in our own mind to do it, but the ultimate goal is the reward that we're looking for. Always, yeah. Follow Your feelings are your compass, so whatever makes you happy, grow towards that. Definitely, I would agree, and you guys have each other, and uh, we... We wish you all the best, and we'll definitely be uh, following you through your journey. And thank you again. Thank Thank you you so much. much. Absolutely. And when we come back, your garden questions and our garden answers right after this. If you have a gardening question, now is the time to call in on the IVOrganics.com 3-in-1 Plant Guard Hotline at 414-444-5250. Beans and Barley Market and Cafe, a neighborhood specialty grocery store for the east side and greater Milwaukee area where you can find all you need from fresh produce to bakery to organic frozen dinners, from wine to fresh squeezed carrot juice, a health food store with hundreds of products, vitamin supplements, bath and body items, magazines, cards, books, and a knowledgeable staff. Catering available, open daily at 8 a.m. The restaurant serves breakfast, lunch, and dinner seven days a week with a menu of good, healthy, homemade food, including vegetarian and non-vegetarian specialties. 1901 East North Avenue, Milwaukee, 414 278 and online at beansandbarley.com. I know you're looking for natural and organic food, but at a great price. I've found the place. Woodman's has what you need. Woodman's offers a huge natural and organic selection with some of the area's largest organic meats, produce, and dairy departments. Shop consciously, but it won't break the bank. They have aisles of all the organic food, snacks, and treats you've been looking for so you and your family can eat healthier without overpaying. Visit their Milwaukee area store locations, Kenosha, Menominee Falls, Oak Creek, and Waukesha, or visit woodmans-food.com to find the nearest location to you. Mycorrhizae is a beneficial fungus from Plant Success Organics.com that will greatly increase your plant's germination, ability, and healthier root structure. You can increase seed sprouting, root growth, and general plant germination. Mycorrhizae can be used with hydroponic root cutting, seed sprouting, cocoa core, and soil. Plant Success Organics.com carries powder, granule, and tablet form of mycorrhizae. Increase the level of mycorrhizae in your soil to give your plant the optimal opportunity to produce incredible harvests. For more information and to purchase visit plantsuccessorganics.com. Tall Earth Wood Treatment All-in-One Preservative and Stain offers lifetime protection and creates a unique silver-aged wood finish. All ingredients are non-toxic, eco-friendly, perfect for garden beds and veg trunks. Find out more at tallearth.com. Free shipping on all orders. Use coupon code W-I-S-C-O-N-V-E-G to save 15% off orders placed at tallearth.com. 
Shield and Seal Vacuum Sealers, and the highest quality vacuum sealing products, unique black and clear in all black bags, protecting your produce and product better than traditional bags. Find out more at shieldandseal.com. Blue Mel's Garden and Landscape Center offers an awesome selection of high quality garden and landscape products. We have just the plants you're looking for. Annuals, perennials, veggies, herbs, and more. Plus, you can always count on us to answer all of your questions and offer expert advice. Blue Mills also carries the largest selection of bulk landscape materials in the area. Enjoy a beverage from our coffee shop while your kids run around in our huge playground. Join our growing list of highly satisfied customers. Visit the garden center that offers everything you're looking for. Visit Blue Mills today. Blue Mills, 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Flame Engineering, Eagle Garden Systems, Bob X, Plant Success, Beans and Barley, MI Gardener, Outpost Natural Food Co-op, Root Assassin, Manure Tea, The Gardener's Hollow Leg. Find all sponsors at thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com and thank them for their support. Thank you. There's a number of ways in which you can get a hold of us. IvyOrganic31.com IvyOrganic.com Hotline through Plant Garden naturally protects plants against damaging sunburn. Insects and rodents protects newly installed plants and trees. Shields prune and damage surfaces for use on your roses, fruit, and nut trees. Ornamental trees and shrubs. This product is non-toxic. Environmentally safe and organic. Visit more, for more information, visit IvyOrganics.com. You can call in right now. 414-444-5250. We had a number of questions come in this week on uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, email, all of that stuff, twvgshow at gmail.com. And one is about Jerusalem artichokes. Now, some people are familiar with these. Other people are not. This is a root crop that's a perennial that will come back year after year. And it can, uh, it does have okay, some... so it okay, has yeah. this... Um, benefit. Benefit. Uh, it's like a probiotic... Or prebiotic, I think, actually, um, component to it. It's like uh, something that just exists in the plant. It's called inulin, not insulin, inulin. Okay. And what it does is it can have a... Uh, it can uh, cause gas, gas to occur diarrhea, in the body. Yeah, like yeah. Kind of a laxative effect almost. Not necessarily diarrhea, but a lot of times gas. And so they had asked, like, how would you deal with that, mm-hmm. um, especially if you're sensitive to that. Well, just like anything that my, your body might have a reaction to, you don't want to, like, just start consuming a ton of it. Right. Um, it has happened for us, and what you do is you just kind of start small and let your body build up a tolerance. Now, Jerusalem artichokes, it is a, it's got, a, it's a substitute for potatoes for, and, and check your, you check with your doctor, but it is, uh, low. It's lower in starch and carbs. And, and it's better for those who are diabetic. Anybody. Anybody, okay. At this point. Uh, another question came in was, when do you pick your pumpkins and how is the best way to store them? Uh, so the answer to that is, uh, when we grow pumpkins, we pick them when they're about 90% ripe. Um, now, this is an orange pumpkin. There are other different colors of pumpkins. So we're talking about the general jack lantern orange pumpkin. About 90% ripe. And if, uh, if that, uh, with the blue and the gray ones, you can kind of gauge on that as well. Now, you want to pick them before the, you get a freeze uh, or the day before a frost because this can affect the, the fruit or the, the actual pumpkin itself. If it freezes, it's going to, you're not going to have any salvageable because it's going to freeze, thaw, and it's going to turn to mush. If you get a light frost, you're okay. Um, the best place to store them is out of direct sunlight, and obviously we don't have the perfect root cellar scenario, but about 50 degrees. Uh, f- about 50 to 55 degrees Fahrenheit and up 50 to 75 percent humidity. Okay, so a, a typical basement, I would say, w- is where we have stor- stored ours, and we've been able to store them from November to about March, April, realistically. That's how far and how long we've been able to store them. Now, we pressure can ours, uh, pumpkins that are not jack lantern that actually are designed for edible. jack and lantern pumpkins, the ones we buy at the store to carve, are actually bred and specifically designed for decoratorial uh, purposes. They're not, they, they can be consumed, yes, but they are not very good. They're very stringy and, and they just don't have any flavor. So your, your, you know, your Cinderella pumpkins, that type of thing, your Jardel pumpkins, those are the edible, the thick wall pumpkins are what you can consume and eat. So we pressure can, pressure can our pumpkins and talk about the procedure in which you go about pressure canning. You cannot water bath. 
No. So that debut pressure can because they are a low acid food. So they're not very high in acid. You need to peel them. Then you need to chop them into about one inch cubes. And then you pressure can them in some water. Maybe a little bit of salt. Salt's not necessary. And the reason being is that if you were to mash them, um, that's too viscous. The liquid is too thick. So, that, so you have to you do have to peel them and then you have to uh, cube them. Uh, so that's why you have to pressure can the pumpkin. Ashley writes in and says, first time gardener, I have been watching many of your videos on other gardening sites. Uh, your videos are definitely the best, straight to the point, and how to fix the fix it. Appreciate it very much. You taking time and helping people like me. Well, you're certainly very welcome, Ashley. We Make the mistakes so you don't have to, and we still make mistakes, so it's not like uh, we've learned and we're good to go. We always want to show the potential problems and the problems that do happen over and over again in the garden, whether you're prepared for them or they unexpectedly come up. Kathy writes in and asks, why, uh, do you, why don't you try the Back to Eden Garden Method? Since I've switched to that, I've had way better growth, but more importantly, I have had no weeds. I have wood chips about four inches deep. Uh, well, that is a good question, and I don't have an absolutely perfect answer for you, or we don't have a perfect answer for you. Uh, the, the Back to Eden method, for those who are unfamiliar with that particular gardening method, it's when you bring wood chips in, uh, preferably from undiseased trees because that can have ill effects on certain species of vegetables and fruits in which you're growing in your garden. And you mound them up across the garden bed five, six, eight inches. Over a course of time, those wood chips begin to break down and feed the soil and actually a- act as a mulch. So what you're not planting in the wood chips themselves, you're moving the wood chips back. For example, if you have a tomato start, you're moving the wood chips back, and then you're digging the hole into the soil, and then you plant your tomato, and then you fill it back in, and and then you move the wood chips back around the base of the plant. Many people think that you're planting in the wood chips themselves, and that is not the case because the wood chips are just the mulch that is breaking down to feed the soil. Now, some back to Eden gardeners are very successful with this. They've put a foot of mulch down and let's set for four or five years, and then that foot of mulch, that foot of wood chips, is now three or four inches of wood chips and six to eight inches of very thick, black, perfect compost. So it is a method in which does work very well if the technique is practiced correctly. Uh, just not something that we have done. Uh, raised bed gardens work very well. Containers work very well. It's a, a unique method in uh, whichever works best for you. And, and we are looking at different techniques in which to increase the yield and growth of our vegetable garden. It's just something that, uh, one, you have to figure out what works good for your schedule your finances, and what you hope your end result will be, which for many of us is a uh, overwhelming amount of produce. So back to eating garden method is something that we will definitely look into uh, in future garden uh, projects. Thank you so much for joining us today on the program. We certainly appreciate your attentiveness and joining us and being part of your day. Programming note, join us next week when we're going to talk about seed saving, how to do that correctly and how to bring and, and save the seeds of the plants in which you like growing this year that we can regrow next year, as well as summer cleanup. Though we've still got some fall crops growing, we still have some jobs that we can do in the garden to help prepare ours uh, for the winter and getting ready for next spring. It's a never-ending journey in the garden. As well as new author, John Markeski, uh, and garden writer, he will be with us, plus your garden questions. Miss any portion of this program or want to revisit it in its entirety, you can certainly do that by going to the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com website, clicking on the uh, radio tab at the top of the page for full in-studio video and podcast of this uh, particular show and all shows that we've done. Want an individual interview or a specific segment? Uh, go to the Highlight tab on the right-hand side of the main page. You can find all of that as well on our YouTube YouTube channel, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener, as well as uh, podcast uh, providers in uh, iTunes, Stitcher, Podomatic, Google Play, TuneIn, and uh, many others. Until next week, for Holly Baird, 
I'm Joy Barrett, and we will see you in... You've been listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Tell a friend and join Joey and Holly again next week so we can all grow together. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is a production of the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com in association with WI Garden Media Broadcast, live from the WNOV 860 AM and the W293CX 106.5 FM. Carrier Communications Studios in Milwaukee, Wisconsin.